Doesn't it seem sometimes like we live in a world of relentless bad news? Just this uh, week, one morning, I got up and I usually take a look at the paper in the morning, and in one morning paper, our local paper here, I read the following headlines. Scores dead in Nigerian city. Bomb threats in Atlanta. Man shot while walking along street in Elgin. Japan stunned by video claiming hostage death. And on the very front page, did you see this? The asteroid is coming. That can't be good news. And none of it even touched the real news of the day, which is the national crisis of deflated footballs. Is it just me or is something really wrong with our culture, if that's what we care most about, deflated footballs? Today we're wrapping up or coming close to the end of a series called Breaking Barriers, Reaching Across Boundaries. And over the last few weeks, we've seen stories in the book of Acts about how the gospel reaches across all kinds of boundaries between people and reaches all kinds of people, even those considered outsiders. We started with Saul of Tarsus, uh, the persecutor of the church, an enemy of the gospel of Christ, and how Jesus turns him around completely. He does a 180 and goes in a new direction. We saw the gospel reaching an Ethiopian eunuch, a very different kind of man as God uses Philip to help him understand the scriptures and the gospel. God uses Peter to reach a Roman centurion named Cornelius. And then we see Romans, the ultimate outsiders from a Jewish perspective, being baptized in the name of Jesus. Now we come to Acts chapter 12. And in a way, the gospel now faces what I would call the ultimate barrier. So today we're beginning in Acts chapter 12. You can open your Bibles, watch on the screens. We're going to end up reading 25 verses, but we'll take them sort of verse at a time. Acts chapter 12. Beginning verse 1, Luke writes, About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now I'm going to pause there because right off the bat, we see we are confronted with the reality of evil. The reality of sin and evil in the world. One of the news stories I mentioned a moment ago when I was looking at the paper about Nigeria um, had to do with atrocities being committed uh, almost every day these days by a terrorist group called Boko Haram. You've probably read about it. You may have heard about it on the news. But just this past week, that particular Islamic extremist group slaughtered over 40 people in seven villages and the world barely heard about it. Over the past two years or so, they are, they are uh, responsible for over 10,000 murders and just a couple of months ago kidnapped 200 young girls who have not been heard from since, probably taken into a terrible kind of slavery. And the only word that describes that kind of activity in our world is evil. Evil's in the world, and we see it here as Acts 12 begins. Luke states bluntly that Herod the king has a man named James killed. He says, put to the sword. Most likely that means he was beheaded, executed in an ancient prison. Now, who was Herod? This is Herod Agrippa I, the grandson of Herod the Great, who was king in this area when Jesus was born some 35 or 38 years earlier. He was so jealous of his position, that particular Herod, that when he heard from the Magi that a child had been born who would be king of Israel, speaking of Jesus, he had all the baby boys about two years of age and under slaughtered in that whole region just to make sure that he had no rival for the throne. That was the grandfather of the Herod we're talking about. Herod Agrippa was educated in Rome for part of his life. He eventually became a friend of the emperor named Caligula, who happened to be one of the most violent and bloodthirsty emperors in all of human history. So Herod was, uh, was tutored by ruthless men and himself became a man primarily concerned with his own position. And he saw the people he ruled as either means to demonstrate his own power or to magnify himself in his own eyes. So Herod was also an evil man. Now, James, the man Herod executed in here, uh, verse 1, was the brother of John, who later wrote the gospel of John that bears his name. James and John were brothers, sons of Zebedee. They were fishermen called by Jesus as uh, two of the 12 original disciples. Scriptures indicate that Jesus gave the two brothers the nickname, Sons of Thunder. We don't exactly know why, but probably because they're, they had strong personalities. We know that Peter did. We don't get to know James all that well before his execution. Or they were just bold and rambunctious type of men. Luke doesn't tell us exactly why Herod has James beheaded. 
We can only guess that James was recognizable as uh, an emerging leader of this young Christian movement, and he figured that killing him would serve to enhance his own reputation. So we continue. Verse 3. And when he saw, when Herod saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. When he saw it pleased the Jews, there's a couple of things going on here. Herod craves power and popularity. He sees that when he has James executed, it serves those two purposes. A certain segment of the population are happy about that and are pleased with Herod. So he decides to do it again, this time arresting Peter. But why did the execution of James please the Jews? He's talking about the the leadership, the religious leadership of the day. See, back in the early part of Acts, if you remember, as the Christian church began to grow, the persecution that arose was toward the Christians who had Greek backgrounds. They were called the Hellenists, uh, men like Stephen, because they were already seen as sort of outsiders to the Jewish people. But the purely Jewish followers of Jesus, men like James and Peter, were not targeted early on. But now this has all changed. Some scholars believe the turning point came in the story of Peter and Cornelius. Remember from a couple weeks ago how Cornelius is a Roman centurion, an outsider, hated by the Jews, and, uh, and, and was seen as unclean before God. But Cornelius is seeking to know more about God. So God speaks to Peter and tells him that the gospel is intended for all people, Jew and Gentile alike. And so Peter goes to Cornelius' house, shares the gospel of Jesus, the whole Holy Spirit comes on them. They are forgiven of their sin, and he begins to baptize Romans. Remember that story? Well, word spreads. Word spreads that these followers of Jesus are now friends of the Romans, and you couldn't commit a more heinous sin in the region of Israel. Highly offensive culturally and religiously to many. That's what's being talked about here. They must have complained to Herod. Now, Herod could care less about the gospel or care less about religious implications. He wasn't a religious man. But he does care about his own popularity and his own power. So he decides, I'll arrest Peter and I'll give him a show that they really want to see. Okay? That's where we are. Now we move to verse 4. And when he had seized him, Peter, and put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God uh, by the church. Now we need to see Herod's intent here. Notice the timing. Uh, It's right before the Passover celebration, which was a big deal in Israel. His plan is then to bring Peter out to the people after the Passover. Any of that ringing a bell? Any other story that you're aware of that follows the same pattern? Right. Jesus was taken captive just before Passover and then brought out to be publicly flogged and crucified the day after Passover. So Herod is planning to execute Peter just like he did James, only this time he's going to make it a public spectacle to put Pontius Pilate to shame. All so he can bask in the power and uh, in, in the glory, in his own power and glory. Now, take a little pause here. At this point, historically speaking, we're about six years or so out from the death and resurrection of Jesus. The church has experienced dramatic growth in that whole region. Along with that growth has come opposition and pain. But now the gospel has leaped over and is penetrating the Gentile world, and the real trouble starts to come. Through the courage and faithfulness of men like Stephen, Philip, Peter and James, the gospel is leaping across all kinds of social, ethnic, and religious barriers, and now it faces the ultimate barrier, which I'm calling the barrier of sheer evil. You can almost hear the questions uh, asked by those who love both James and Peter, what they might have been asking in their grief and fear. Why is this happening now? Why James? What's going to happen to Peter? Why do good and godly men lose their lives at the whim of such an evil man? Those are difficult questions. Those are the questions that swirl within us even today, maybe on a daily basis. What's going on, God? This is what we get for following you, for trusting you. Sometimes I think we tend to assume that faith and faithfulness always equals blessing and comfort. There are times when quite the opposite is true. Faith and faithfulness can guarantee harassment and persecution. 
Now, why does such ra seemingly random and wanton evil even exist in the first place? Difficult, but an important question. The whole Bible, in a sense, is written to answer that particular question. But let me give you just a brief summary, and, and I've done this before. God created all that is in love and freedom. Satan, once an angel of light, became proud and rebelled against God and set himself against God. God created human beings in his own image for an eternal relationship with him. But human beings also rebelled against God and sinned against him and against each other. The result was the fall of all creation into sin and death. And all of that happens in the first three chapters of the Bible, the book of Genesis. The rest of the Bible... The rest of the whole Bible is the story of how God is redeeming this broken world through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel is God's remedy for rebellion. The gospel is God's remedy for our sin, for evil in the world, and for death itself. Now, the book of Acts teaches us that the gospel does not necessarily protect us from all evil, but the gospel does enable us to triumph over evil through the redemptive work of Christ. That's point one, the reality of evil in the world. Point two here we see is the deliverance of Peter. We move into the next phase of the story, the deliverance of Peter. Uh, most of you know that I lead a men's ministry here on Friday mornings at 6 a.m. called Team. Uh, here's a photograph of what that looks like every Friday morning. Do we have that picture? There we go. It's right here in this room. 200 guys come out 6 a.m. every Friday morning. It's kind of unbelievable to me when they show up every Friday morning, no matter what the weather is. But on Friday mornings, I set my alarm at 4.15 a.m. Because I like to get up early and prepare and all that. But in the 16 years I've been doing team, my alarm's only gone off three times. Because I just have this way, because I'm thinking about it, of waking up right about 4 o'clock every Friday morning. Except this past Friday morning, or two Friday mornings ago. I happened to be out late on a Thursday night. One of my sons had a basketball game. Got to bed later than I usually do on a Thursday night. So when my alarm went off Friday morning at 4.15, I was in the middle of some sort of weird, deep sleep stage dream. And I woke up and I was completely disoriented. It's making the sound. I don't know where the sound is coming from. I don't even know what day it is. Then it hits me that that's my alarm. And I figure it must be Saturday morning. And I must have forgot to turn it off on Friday morning. And then I slowly woke up and realized... No, it's Friday morning. I just slept in and my alarm went off for the third time in 16 years. And my wife wasn't really happy about that when we talked about it later in the day. Have you ever woken up after a vivid dream, not quite sure for a few moments whether you were still dreaming or whether you were awake yet? Has that ever happened to you? I think it happens to some of us now and then. We see that actually here in this story. Look at verse 6. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, talking about Peter, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries before the door regarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter on the side and woke him saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision or thought he was still dreaming. Now, if you read this story slowly and think about it and read it like not a Bible story, but just a story, it's both miraculous and just a little bit funny at the same time. Think of it. Peter's in prison. Uh, it couldn't have been a good place. Maybe he's sleeping on a stone floor, maybe on sand. He's bound with chains. He's sleeping between two armed guards, uh, yet is sleeping so soundly that the angel of God who shows up with blinding light has to smack him to wake him up. Does anybody in your house sleep like that? Do you have any heavy sleepers in your house? We have a couple in our house. Even then, when he wakes up, Peter thinks he must still be dreaming. Verse 10, and when they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I'm sure that the Lord God, the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that, that the Jewish people were expecting, which was his execution on the next day. Now, there are all kinds of weird little details in the story that I'm going to point out that are evidence for the authenticity of this story. Because if you were making up the story, you would never think to put these little details in here. First, Peter's a heavy sleeper. We covered that. Second, notice that the angel has to remind Peter to put his clothes on. Now, I don't know if he was 
without any clothes in that prison, maybe just a loincloth or something. So the angel comes, has to kick him to wake him up, and says, Peter, okay, got to get dressed now. We're going to leave. Okay, put on your clothes. Put your sandals on. We're going to go for a walk. Oh, don't forget your coat. It's cold outside. He's reminding him like a mom to get dressed because Peter's just out of it. He's wandering around. He's putting his stuff on. You know, he's, he's sleeping. He's, he's a heavy sleeper. So we notice that. That's funny to me. Suddenly, they walk right by the guards. Iron gates open by themselves. Okay, this is a God thing. And once the angel gets him out of jail, leaves him cold in the middle of the street. Gone. Now we see Peter finally sort of comes to his senses and he goes, Whoa, that was kind of a miracle. Now what am I going to do? Verse 12, and when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, kind of got to follow that, uh, where many were gathered together and were praying. Now this is not Mary, the mother of Jesus, nor Mary Magdalene, but another Mary. Mary is a very common name in those days. Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. Now this is not John the Apostle, who was the brother of James, but rather the John Mark we're going to meet later in Acts, who becomes a traveling companion to the Apostle Paul and to Barnabas. Luke tells us that they're gathered together in Mary's house praying. So this is clearly a group of Peter's good friends from the church who are gathered to pray through the night for their dear friend who they know has been arrested by Herod and is probably facing the same fate as James' execution. Verse 13. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, Peter's knocking on Mary's house, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. How many of you knew that name was in the Bible, Rhoda? You just thought it was like a TV show a few years ago, okay? Rhoda. Recognizing Peter's voice, watch this now. This, this story is, there's no way you could make this up. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it's his angel. It's not really him. But Peter continued knocking. Yo! <laughs> He's knocking. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. Now, here's a few more little unnecessary details. Why would someone think to put an insignificant servant girl in this story by name? It's the only place she shows up in the entire Bible. And for 2,000 years, her name has been there. Why would you put her in there unless that's really the way things happened? I also can't help but notice the humanity, just the ordinary humanity of this group of early believers. Here they are in a prayer meeting, in a house, and they've met specifically to pray for Peter. They've met specifically to pray all night if necessary to God for the protection and maybe even the miraculous release of Peter. And when he actually shows up, miraculously released from prison, they don't believe it's possible. Uh, you're, you're, you're making that up. You're seeing things. That's got to be as good. It can't happen. It can't happen. Have you ever prayed for something that deep down you didn't believe God could really do? Have you ever prayed for something that deep down you feared was impossible? I think many of us have done that. And I see that here in this story. Sometimes we struggle to see what God is doing even when he's already doing it right in front of our noses. Verse 17, but motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he's got to calm them all down now, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and then he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Now he's talking about a different James here, uh, not James the son of Zebedee who had been executed, but rather James who's called in Scripture the brother of the Lord, likely the half-brother of Jesus, one of the uh, uh, boys born later to Mary and Joseph who becomes a follower of Jesus. Later he becomes a leader in the Jerusalem Christian community. But here's the big question I want to ask here. Putting aside the details and the, the, the gentle humor of the story and leaving aside Peter left hanging outside the door too long, the question that occurs to me to ask is, why does God send an angel to rescue Peter yet allow James to be executed by Herod just days before? It's a disturbing question, a difficult question. A few years ago, my father, as some of you know, had a serious stroke. The first thing the doctors told us, that the damage to his brain was so great he had zero chance of meaningful recovery, so we were prepared to let him go. Second doctor looked at the, the MRI or whatever it was, told us that he thought the bleed was on the exterior of the surface of his brain, therefore with a particular medical procedure could be reversed. We authorized it. Long story short, my father made a complete recovery and is playing golf today, driving at age of 81. Just a wonderful recovery. Well, about a, within about a month of that happening, a woman came to talk to me uh, at the, after one of our services here at West Campus 
It said, at, at all, at right about the same time as my father's stroke, her father had a stroke. Only her father never regained consciousness and passed away. Now, she didn't ask me for an explanation. Had she asked me for one, I couldn't have even come close to giving a, giving a satisfactory answer to her. The simple answer to the why question is we don't know. We don't know. We don't have access to that information. But we do have answers to the who question. We know through Scripture that God is good. We know that God is sovereign over all things ultimately. We know there is evil in the world because Satan is trying to destroy all that God made as good. We know that God's response to sin and evil is to send his son into the world, that, that through Jesus, sin, evil, and death itself are ultimately defeated. That's what we know. But the why question, we don't know. We continue. Then he departed and went to another place. That is, Peter got out of town to lay low for a while. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. At least Herod is consistent in his brutality. Now we come to kind of the curious end of the story. The third thing we see in the story is the judgment of God. The judgment of God. Of God. Way back in 1966, some of you will remember this, the rock and roll band and cultural phenomenon called the Beatles were reaching the peak of their popularity. Okay? Uh, John Lennon was quoted during that time as saying this. This is the whole quote. He said, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right and I'll be proved right. We are more popular than Jesus now, he said. You've probably seen that quote somewhere. We're more popular than Jesus now. Now, his, his remarks created an uproar in large portions of the U.S., particularly in the Bible Belt, Belt South. And although he later tried to soften his remarks by saying he just intended to say that the youth of England treated them as if they were more uh, uh, popular than Jesus, still it was remembered as, a, as almost incredibly arrogant and self-serving comment. But John Lennon had nothing on King Herod. The Bible says, then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent some time there. That is, Herod got out of Jerusalem. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. i got to explain what's happening here. Tyre and Sidon are coastal cities in Syria that were dependent on food produced in the region of Judea. But Herod is upset about something with those people. Probably they weren't giving him the respect that he craved. And so he's starving a whole region of people by not sending food to them. Okay, he's starving them out because he can. He's king. So they send representatives to beg for his favor, trying to get food for their people, knowing they're going to have to do something to ingratiate themselves. That's the setting. Verse 21. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Right? Picture the scene. Herod comes into the group, into the room, flowing robes, great pomp and circumstance, allowing his groveling guest to bask in his kingly greatness. Then he pontificates about whatever it is kings pontificate about, all the while imagining himself to be the greatest orator in the history of humankind. His guests fall all over themselves, praising his magnificence because they're desperate and they're willing to do anything that might get them some food. So they praise him as a god, small g. It's the voice of a god, they say, small g. Then Herod makes his biggest mistake. He allows them to do so without redirecting their praise to the true God. Here's what happens next, verse 23. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give glory to God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. The Jewish historian Josephus, actually in a secular account, uh, confirms the basic outline of this story, attributing Herod's death to, quote, a severe pain that arose in his belly, striking with almost a violent intensity, unquote. The point is, although Herod possessed the political position and power to inflict suffering and death on those he ruled, he was not God. Just as Peter's escape let the believers know that God had not abandoned them, so here Herod's death reminds them that God is sovereign. God is sovereign and will one day judge all evil. Does sin and evil sometimes seem to rule the day today? Yes, it does sometimes. 
Will it always be this way? No, it won't. A judgment day is coming. Those of you who are in the all-time bestseller book club will get there in a few weeks when you get to the book of Revelation. A few years later, the Apostle Paul would write this in Galatians chapter 6. Do not be deceived, he writes. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Herod discovered that to be true, and he discovered it the hard way. Like the whole book of Acts so far, this story ends with what I'm calling the fourth point today, and it ends with the spread of the gospel. The spread of the gospel. We live in an age of the viral video. You know, what, you know what a viral video is, right? You know, someone uses their cell phone to videotape their dog eating an ice cream cone, post it on one of the social media sites like Facebook or Twitter. Within 24 hours, it's been seen by 2 billion people, right? Or a million people or however many people. Viral videos. It's, uh, if I see something interesting on the Internet, which happens every now and then, I'll see something. Hey, 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 guys, tell my boys, hey, you want to see this? Oh, I saw it two days ago, Dad. I saw it two days ago and I passed it on to my zillion electronic friends. You know, so I'm like way behind. We live in a world of viral communication. That is, images and words can be spread at the speed of light and reach more people, people more quickly than ever before in human history. That's the age we live in. Now, this technology is a kind of Pandora's box. It can be used for good, for not so good, and for the completely frivolous. Here's an example of the good. And you may not be aware of this. A couple of weeks ago, we shared a gospel story video in all our weekend services. You remember the story of Matt Caterer? He was the guy who had a successful music career with a punk rock band. Before realizing the deep spiritual emptiness that lay at the center of his life, he shared how a series of events led him into faith in Christ and now, how now he's a devoted follower of Jesus, plays in our West Campus bands on occasion on Sunday morning and Saturday night. That's a great story. If you haven't seen it, go to our, our, our web page and you can click on Gospel Stories, watch Matt Cater's Gospel Story. Well, after we showed it in our weekend services, we then posted that video or linked to it on our social media websites the First Baptist Church of Geneva Facebook page, and our Twitter feed and so forth. And in two days, that video reached over 6,000 people. In two days. Reached over, and it's still out there now being shared, being shared, being shared. That's a good viral video. Verse 24, we see the end of the story. But the word of God increased and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. What I want you to focus is on is that verse 24. But the word of God increased and multiplied. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. This story began how? The story began in verse 1 of chapter 12 with the execution of James. The summary execution by beheading of one of the original disciples. It began with oppressive and terrifying evil. It ends with the viral growth of the gospel in 25 verses. See, the book of Acts that we've, we've seen so far and will continue to see is all about the spread of the gospel. We see the gospel spread through preaching and teaching, and that's what, kind of what we expect. Then we see it spread through miracles and healing. We see it spread through personal encounters. We see it spread through persecution and suffering. We even see it spread through the martyrdom of Stephen and James. You see, in that sense, the gospel has always been viral. That is, it, is a, it's the very nature of the gospel to spread. It leaps across boundaries. It spreads from person to person, from people group to people group, from culture to culture, by any means available and by any means necessary. The book of Acts is telling us the gospel is unstoppable. It cannot be contained by social, cultural, political, economic, or religious barriers. It can't be stopped by persecution, by suffering. It can't be stopped by evil or even death itself. And in that way, the gospel is like a virus. It's passed from person to person, but it's a virus that brings not death, but life. Life eternal. Chances are, you're here today because somewhere along the line, you caught the gospel virus, and you probably caught it from somebody. You caught the gospel virus, and it began to change your heart, change your life from the inside out. That's why you're here. I hope so. But here's the question the book of Acts demands that we answer. Are we willing, are you willing to pass that virus on to someone else? Will you bow with me as I close tonight? 
Lord God, I thank you so much for this story, strange as it is, moving from evil to the spread of your gospel. We thank you for the story of your church, which is the story of the book of Acts, which is our story here today. We thank you for the power of the gospel to break barriers, to reach across boundaries, to bring hope in the midst of this dark and broken world. And may we learn to be, by your guidance and leadership, ambassadors of that great good hope. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.